Guard what has been entrusted to you. A Sermon for the Feast of St. Joseph by Jacques Menin Bossuet We are all perfectly well aware that to hold something in trust is to fulfill a sacred duty, one that not only calls upon our honour, but even requires a kind of religious observance. St. Ambrose tells us of the pious custom of the faithful bringing their most valued possessions to the bishops and clergy for safekeeping before the altar. Theirs was a kind of holy intuition that treasures could not be better kept than where God had placed his own sacred mysteries. This custom was handed down from the synagogue of old. In the sacred history, we read that the venerable temple of Jerusalem was a place of safekeeping for the Jews. From profane writers, we learn that the pagans paid the same honour to their false gods by placing their treasures in their temples and by confiding them to their priests. It is as if nature were teaching us that the obligation to keep a trust is a religious one and that precious objects cannot be safer than where the divinity is revered and in hands consecrated to religion. Yet if ever there were a trust that was worthy of the name sacred and of being guarded in a holy manner, it is the one of which I speak today, the one that the providence of the Eternal Father committed to the faith of that just man, Joseph. His very house became a kind of temple that God deigned to inhabit. To guard such a treasure, Joseph himself had to be consecrated, and truly he was. For his body was consecrated by purity, and his soul by all the gifts of grace. O Mary, you saw the effects of the grace that filled him. I need your assistance to make them known. May I not hope for your most powerful intercession when I undertake to praise the chaste spouse chosen by the Father to preserve the purity that was so dear and precious to you. We therefore have recourse to you, O Mary, and greet you with the angel, saying, Ave, gratia plena. In my plan of basing the praise of St. Joseph, not upon doubtful conjectures, but upon a solid doctrine drawn from the Holy Scriptures and the Fathers, I cannot better observe the solemnity of this day than by presenting this great sin to you as a man singled out to guard God's treasure and to be his trustee here below. I shall attempt to explain that this worthy title of trustee a title that unfolds the designs of God for this blessed patriarch, discloses the source of all his graces and the sure foundation of his honour. It is a simple matter for me to show you how estimable is this quality. For if the name of trustee is a mark of honour and testifies to probity, if, in order to confide a trust, we choose the one whose virtue is most assured, whose fidelity is most proven, and, finally, the one who is the most intimate and most confidential of our friends, then how shall we measure the glory of St. Joseph? God made him the trustee not only of Blessed Mary, whose angelic purity made her so acceptable in his eyes, but still more of his own son, the sole object of his delight and the unique hope of our salvation. St. Joseph he made the trustee of the common treasure of God and man, the person of Jesus Christ. What eloquence could equal the grandeur and majesty of this title? He cannot be rightly praised without the assistance of grace. Grace will help me to plumb so deep a mystery and seek in the scriptures what is said of Joseph, so as to enable you to see that everything may be traced back to this great role of trustee. In the Gospels, I find three things entrusted to Joseph. And I also find three virtues that shine forth, virtues corresponding to those three treasures. These are the matters that must be explained in an orderly way. The first of the treasures committed to his trust, the first that is in the order of time, was the holy virginity of Mary, which he had to preserve inviolate under the sacred veil of marriage and which he always religiously protected as a sacred trust. The second, and the more imposing, was the person of Jesus Christ, 
whom the heavenly Father placed in his hands, so that he might serve as the earthly father of the holy child. The third you will find most admirable, if I am able to explain it to you clearly. To understand it, we must realize that a secret is a kind of treasure. To betray the secret of a friend is to violate the sanctity of trust. The law says that if you spread abroad the secret of a testament that I confide in you, I may then take action against you for your lapse as trustee. The reason for this is plain. A secret is a kind of trust. From this you will easily comprehend that Joseph was the trustee of the Eternal Father because God told him his secret. Which secret? The marvellous secret of the incarnation of his Son. God's plan was not to reveal Jesus Christ to the world before his hour had come. St. Joseph was chosen not only to keep the secret, but even to conceal it. Thus, we read in the Gospel that, with Mary, he marveled at all that was said of the Saviour. But we do not read that he spoke, because the Eternal Father revealed the mystery to him in secret, and under the obligation of silence. St. Bernard explained, God desired to entrust to his faithfulness the most sacred secret of his heart. How precious you are to God, O peerless Joseph, for to you he confided his three great treasures, the virginity of Mary, the person of his only begotten Son, and the secret of all his mystery. You must not think that Joseph was ungrateful for these graces. If God honoured him by his threefold trust for his part in the gospel, he made an offering to God of the three virtues that I noted. I do not doubt that his life was adorned with all the others, but here are the three principal ones that God presents to us in his scripture. The first, his purity, is demonstrated by his continence in marriage. Who does not see the purity of Joseph in that holy society of chaste desires and that admirable correspondence with the virginity of Mary in their spiritual wedding? The second was his fidelity. How faithful was his untiring care for Jesus along the many journeys that awaited the Holy Child from the beginning of his life. The third was his humility. Although the possessor of the greatest of treasures, through an extraordinary grace of the Eternal Father, far from preening himself on his gifts, or publicizing his advantages, he hid himself from mortal eyes as much as possible, peaceably enjoying with God the mystery that God had revealed to him, and the infinite riches that God had entrusted to him. Here we are in the presence of greatness, a greatness that offers crucial lessons. There is greatness in these treasures and in the example of these virtues. Let us enter into the heart of the mystery by admiring God's plan for the matchless Joseph. Having seen him entrusted with great cares, having seen his virtues, let us consider the connection of the former with the latter and let us make this correspondence the division of our discourse. What virtue did Joseph require in order to protect the virginity of Mary under the veil of marriage? An angelic purity that might in some way correspond to the purity of his chaste spouse. What virtue was required to preserve the Saviour Jesus among the many persecutions that attacked him from his infancy? An inviolable fidelity, one that would not be shaken amid peril. And last, what virtue enabled him to keep God's secret? An admirable humility that fears the eyes of men and does not wish to show itself to the world, but instead loves to hide with Jesus Christ. Depositum Custodi O Joseph, guard what has been entrusted to you. Protect the virginity of Mary and, to protect it within marriage, 
join to it your own purity. Protect that precious life on which depends the salvation of mankind. Preserve it amid so many dangers. Protect the secret of the Eternal Father, for he wants his Son to be hidden from the world. Be a sacred veil for him, and wrap him in the obscurity that covers you, by your love for the hidden life. These are the points that I propose to explain with the help of grace. 1. In order fully to comprehend the great honour that God accorded to St. Joseph when he entrusted him with Mary's virginity, we must first understand how precious this virginity is to heaven and how useful it is to the earth. The Holy Scriptures show how necessary this virginity was to bring Jesus Christ to the world. It was the design of providence that just as God had begotten his Son from all eternity by a virginal generation, so also, when he had to be born in time, he came forth from a virgin mother. This is why the prophets had announced that a virgin would conceive a son. Our fathers lived in this hope, and the gospel has shown to us its blessed fulfilment. If, however, we may be allowed to inquire into the causes of so great a mystery, it seems to me that a weighty one may be found. For by examining the nature of holy virginity according to the teaching of the fathers, we may note its secret power, a power that in some sense obliged the Son of God to come into the world by its cooperation. Let us then ask the ancient doctors in what manner they would define Christian virginity. They reply with one accord that it is an imitation of the life of the angels, that it places men above their bodies by a disdain for bodily pleasures, and that it elevates the flesh so much that, if we may say so, it comes to equal the purity of the spirit. Teach us, O great Augustine, let us hear of your high regard for virgins. Here is a lovely phrase. They have in the flesh, he says, something that is not of the flesh, and that belongs more to angels than to men. Virginity, then, is a kind of middle state between the spirit and the body. It brings us nearer to spiritual beings. It is now easy to comprehend why this virtue should have preceded the mystery of the Incarnation. For what is the mystery of the Incarnation? It is the intimate union of God with man, of divinity with flesh. The Word was made flesh, says the Evangelist. Here is the union, here is the mystery. Yet does it not seem that there is too great a disproportion between the corruption of our bodies and the immortal beauty of that pure spirit? Can it be possible to unite natures that are so far apart? It is for that reason that holy virginity was placed between the two, so as to bring them together by its mediation. Light falling upon opaque bodies that cannot penetrate them, but seems on the contrary to retreat by reflecting back upon its own rays. Yet light enters and unites itself to a transparent body, because in it the light finds the brilliance and the transparency that approach its own nature and contain something of light. In a similar way, we may say that the divinity of the eternal word, wanting to unite itself to a mortal body, demanded the blessed mediation of holy virginity, which, having in it something spiritual, was in some sense able to prepare the flesh to be united to this pure spirit. I do not speak of this matter on my own authority. Learn this truth from a famous bishop of the East, the great Gregory of Nyssa. It is virginity that makes God not refuse to dwell with men, and that gives men their wings on which to fly heavenward. It is virginity that makes God not refuse to dwell with men, and that gives men their wings on which to fly heavenward. As a sacred bond of friendship between man and God, it brings together, by its mediation, things that are far removed from one another by their natures. 
Could the truth that I am preaching be confirmed with greater clarity? Do you not see in it the worthiness of both Mary and of Joseph, her faithful spouse? You see the worthiness of Mary, for her blessed virginity was chosen from all eternity to give Jesus Christ to the world. And you see the worthiness of Joseph, for Mary's purity, so essential to mankind, was confided to his care. Thus, he preserved what was most necessary to the world. O Joseph, guard what has been entrusted to you. As it pleased the Eternal Father to guard Mary's virginity under the veil of marriage, it could no longer be preserved without you, and thus your purity has in some sense become necessary to the world by the glorious charge that was given to you to protect the purity of Mary. At this point we must consider the celestial marriage, designed by providence to protect virginity, and by this means to give Jesus Christ to the world. Who should I take as a guide in this difficult subject, if not the incomparable Augustine, who has treated of this mystery in so divine a manner? Listen to this wise bishop and attend closely to his thoughts. He first remarks that in marriage there are three bonds. There is the sacred contract by which those who are united give themselves to one another without reserve. Second, there is the conjugal love by which they mutually vow hearts that can no longer be divided and that can burn with no other passion. Third, there are the children. The love of the parents is strengthened by seeing itself in the common fruit of the marriage. St. Augustine finds these three things in the marriage of St. Joseph, and he shows us that they all contribute to protecting his virginity. In the sacred contract by which they were given to one another is the triumph of purity, for Mary belonged to Joseph, and Joseph to the divine Mary and their marriage was most true, because they gave themselves to one another. How? Purity, here is your triumph. Each ceded the right to guard their purity to the other. Yes, Mary had the right to guard Joseph's virginity, and Joseph had the right to guard Mary's. These are the promises that brought them together. This was the treaty that bound them. Two virgins united themselves in order that each might preserve the other eternally by the chaste correspondence of their modest desires. It is as though we were seeing two stars enter into conjunction only by the alignment of their lights. Therefore the bond of this marriage, says St. Augustine, is all the more firm, the promises they made to one another were the more unshakable for the very reason that they were the more holy. Who now can describe the conjugal love of these blessed married ones? For, O holy virginity, your flames are all the stronger to the extent that they are purer and more detached, and the fire of concupiscence, which is burning in our bodies, can never equal the ardour of the chaste embraces of these spirits bound together by the love of purity. I seek no reasons to prove this truth. I shall find it upon a great miracle I have read about in St. Gregory of Tours, in the first book of his history. The retelling will please, or at least refresh you. He tells us that a man and woman from the highest nobility in Auvergne, having lived in marriage with perfect continence, passed over to a happier life and that their bodies were buried in two places some distance apart. But a strange thing happened. It seemed that they could not long endure such a severe separation, and everyone marvelled to see their tombs suddenly brought together without anyone having laid a hand to the work. What does this miracle signify? Does it not seem to you that these chaste dead sorrowed to see themselves separated? Does it not seem to you that they are saying to us, Permit me to bring them to life and to lend them a voice. God, after all, has permitted them to move. Why did they bury us apart? 
We were together for so long, and we were like the dead, because we had extinguished every sentiment of mortal pleasure. And as we were so long accustomed to be together like the dead, death ought not to separate us. God allowed them to be reunited, to show us in this miracle that the loveliest flames are not those in which concupiscence is mixed, but those produced by two virgins united in spiritual marriage can, it seems, last even unto the very ashes of death. That is why Gregory of Tours, who narrated this history for us, added that the people of this country called these tombs the tombs of the two lovers, as if the people had wished to say that they were true lovers because they loved by the Spirit. Yet even so spiritual a love was not as perfect as the marriage of St. Joseph. The love in his union was entirely celestial, because all of his passions and all of his desires were directed to the preservation of virginity. This truth may be easily understood. Tell us, O divine Joseph, what it is that you love in Mary. Doubtless not mortal beauty. It was that hidden and interior beauty whose principal ornament was holy virginity. It was, therefore, the purity of Mary that was the object of his chaste passion. And the more he loved his purity, the more he wished to guard it. First in his holy spouse, and secondly in himself, by a complete union of hearts. How marvellous it is that everything in this marriage works to uphold the sacred trust. Their promises are wholly pure. Their love is wholly virginal. It remains now to consider the greatest marvel, the sacred fruit of the marriage, Jesus the Saviour. You must be astonished to hear me preach with such assurance that Jesus was the fruit of this marriage. Of course, you may say, the incomparable Joseph was the father of Jesus Christ through his care for him. But we also know that he had no part in his blessed birth. How then can you assure us that Jesus was the fruit of this marriage? It may seem impossible, but it is nevertheless true that in a certain sense this blessed infant Jesus came out of the virginal union of these two spouses. For have we not said that it was the virginity of Mary that drew Jesus Christ from heaven? Is not Jesus the blessed flower to which virginity gave the growth? Is he not the blessed fruit that virginity brought forth? Yes, certainly, St. Fulgence tells us. He is the fruit, he is the ornament, he is the price and the reward of holy virginity. It was on account of her purity that Mary pleased the Eternal Father. It was on account of her purity that the Holy Spirit overshadowed her. May we not then say that it was her purity that made her fruitful? Now, if it was her purity that made her fruitful, I do not fear to assure you that Joseph also had a part in this great miracle. For if that angelic purity was the possession of the divine Mary, it was also entrusted to Joseph the just. I will proceed further and tell you that Mary's purity was not only the trust, but also the possession of her holy spouse. Her purity belonged to him by marriage. It belonged to him by the chaste care with which he preserved it. O fruitful virginity, if you were Mary's possession, you also were Joseph's. Mary vowed it, Joseph preserved it, and both of them presented it to the Eternal Father as a treasure guarded by their common care. As he had such a part of Mary's holy virginity, he also partook of the fruit that it bore. This is why Jesus is his Son, not in truth according to the flesh, but his Son by the Spirit thanks to the alliance that joined him to his mother. St. Augustine said it with commendable brevity. On account of this faithful bond, they merited the name parents of Christ. O mystery of purity! O blessed paternity! O incorruptible light, which shines throughout this marriage! 
let us ponder these truths and apply them to ourselves. Everything here was done for love of us. Let us then take instruction from what was worked for our salvation. You see how chaste and innocent is the doctrine of Christianity. Shall we never understand who we are? What shame that we should besmirch ourselves every day by every kind of impurity, we who have been raised in the presence of such chaste mysteries. When shall we understand the dignity of our bodies, whose, like the Son of God, has taken on? Let the flesh be taken lightly, said Tertullian, or rather, let it be corrupted before it had been sought out by its master. It was not then worthy of the gift of salvation, nor fit for the office of holiness. It was still, in Adam, tyrannized over by its desires, seduced by apparent beauty, and fastened by the eyes to the earth. It was impure and soiled, because it had not yet been washed in baptism. But God did not want to come into this world as a man, unless first drawn by holy virginity. Even married holiness was beneath him. And so he wanted to have a virgin mother, and he wanted Joseph by his countenance to be made worthy to care for him. Since that day on which his blood sanctified life-giving water, in order that our flesh might be cleansed of its filth, the flesh is entirely changed. It is no longer that flesh formed from mud and born from concupiscence. It is flesh that has been refashioned and renewed by the purest water and by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, my brothers, let us respect our bodies, which are the members of Jesus Christ. Let us keep ourselves from prostituting to impurity this flesh that baptism has made to be virginal. Let us possess our vessels in honor, and not in those shameful passions that our brutality inspires in us, as they do in the Gentiles who have no God. For God does not call us to impurity, but to sanctification in our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 4, 4 4-7 By our countenance, let us honor the holy virginity that gave us the Saviour, that rendered his mother fruitful, and that made Joseph a part of that blessed fecundity, and raised him, if I dare say so, even to being the very father of Jesus Christ. After seeing what he contributed, in a certain way, to the birth of Jesus Christ, let us now see his paternal care, and let us admire the fidelity by which he preserved the divine child whom the heavenly Father had confided to him. 2. It was not enough for the Eternal Father to have confided Mary's virginity to Joseph. He prepared something still more exalted for him. Into the hands of this patriarch he placed Jesus Christ himself. Looking into this secret, into the depths of this mystery, we find so great an honor given to Joseph that we will never be able fully to understand it. For Jesus whom Joseph always watched and who was the beloved subject of his holy anxiety, was born as an orphan upon this earth and had no father in this world. This is why St. Paul said that he was without a father. Sine Patre, Hebrews 7.3 It is true that he had one in heaven, yet it seems that this father had abandoned him and knew him no longer. He would complain of this one day upon the cross, when he called him his God and not his Father, saying, Why have you abandoned me? Matthew 27.46 Yet what he said while dying, he could have said from his birth. For from that first moment, his Father exposed him to persecution and abandoned him to injury. All that he did in favor of this only begotten Son, to show that he had not forgotten him, at least according to what we see, was to place him in the keeping of an upright man who would watch over his painful childhood. It was Joseph who was chosen for this service. What will this holy man do? 
Who could describe the joy with which he received this abandoned one, and how he offered himself from his whole heart to be the father of this orphan? Thenceforth he lived only for Jesus Christ. He had no care but for him. For this God he took on the heart and the soul of a father, and what he was not by nature he became by affection. Yet we are convinced of the truth of so great a mystery, and one so glorious for Joseph, by the evidence of the Scriptures. Consider this beautiful reflection by St. John Chrysostom. He notes that in the Gospel, Joseph always appears as a father. He bestowed the name Jesus upon the child, as fathers did in those days. He alone was forewarned by the angel of all the threats to the child, and the return was announced to him alone. Jesus revered and obeyed Joseph, who directed all of his conduct as having the principal care for it. Whence all this? asks Chrysostom. Here is the true reason. It was the design of God to give to the great St. Joseph everything that could belong to a father without injuring virginity. I do not know whether I understand the full significance of this thought, but, unless I am mistaken, this is what the great bishop meant. Let us first suppose it to be certain that it was for the sake of holy virginity that the Son of God did not choose a mortal father when becoming man. And because he had to be born of a virgin mother, he could have no father but God. It was virginity, therefore, that prevented Joseph's fatherhood. But this would not preclude Joseph from having the other qualities of a father, says Chrysostom, for holy virginity is opposed only to those qualities that would injure it. In the name of father, there are qualities that purity has no difficulty recognizing as her own. Is virginity harmed by care? or tenderness, or affection. See then God's secret arrangement, in which Joseph's fatherhood is brought together with virginal purity. All that belongs to a father without virginity being affected, he says. This is what I give you. Mary, therefore, will not conceive by Joseph, but Joseph will share all the labors and anxieties by which Mary will raise the holy child and he will feel for Jesus the natural inclination and the tender emotions and feelings of a fatherly heart. You will perhaps ask where he will find this fatherly heart if nature does not provide it for him. Can these natural inclinations be acquired by choice? Can art imitate what nature writes in the heart? If Joseph be not a father, how will he have a father's love? Here it is that we must acknowledge that a divine power acts in this work. It is by an effect of this power that St. Joseph has a father's heart, and if nature does not give him one, God makes him one with his own hand. For it is written of God that he turns inclinations where he will. To understand this, we must consider the beautiful theology taught to us by the psalmist when he says that God forms every human heart one by one. Psalm 32.15 Do not believe that David sees the heart as a simple organ of the body, that God forms by his power as he does all the other parts of which man is composed. He means something in particular. He considers the heart to be the principle of inclination, and he sees it as soft and moist earth, in the hands of God, an earth that yields to and obeys the hands of the potter and receives its shape from them. It is in this way, the psalmist tells us, that God forms each of the hearts of men one by one. What does this mean, one by one? He fashions a heart of flesh in some when he softens it by charity, and a hardened heart in others when, pulling back his light in just punishment of their crimes, he abandons them to their reprobate senses. 
he gives to each of the faithful not the heart of a slave when he sends them the spirit of his son, but that of a child. The apostles first trembled at the least peril, but God made them entirely new hearts, and their courage became invincible. What was Saul's cast of mind while he tended his flock? Doubtless low and common, yet in placing him on the throne, God changed his heart by his anointing. See 1 Kings 10.9 And he recognized immediately that he was a king. For their part, the Israelites considered this new monarch to be a man from the dregs of the people. But the hand of God touched their hearts as well. 1 Kings 10.26 And at once they recognized his greatness, and in looking upon him, they were moved by that respectful fear that one has for one sovereign. God had placed in them the hearts of subjects. It is the same hand that forms the hearts of men one by one, who placed a father's heart in Joseph and a son's heart in Jesus. This is why Jesus obeyed, and why Joseph did not fear to command him. Whence the boldness to command his Creator, the true Father of Jesus Christ, the God who begot him in eternity, chose holy Joseph to serve as the father for his only begotten son in time, and caused his veins to flow with a certain ray or spark of his infinite love for his son. He changed his heart. He gave him a father's love. And Joseph, who sensed in himself a paternal heart, formed by the very hand of God, also sensed that God had ordained him to employ paternal authority, and thus he dared to command the one whom he recognized as his master. And after all of this, need I explain Joseph's fidelity in guarding this sacred trust? Could he have been wanting in fidelity toward the one whom he recognized as his only son? I would not have to speak about this virtue were there not need for such a compelling example of it. For here we learn, by the continual journeys that were required of St. Joseph once Jesus Christ was placed under his protection, that this trust cannot be preserved without effort, and that, to be faithful to grace, one must be prepared to suffer. Yes, certainly, when Jesus came into a place, he brought his cross. He carried with him all of his spines, and he shared them with those he loved. Jesus and Mary were poor, but they did not yet lack a home. They had a roof over their heads. As soon as this child came into the world, there was no more home for them, and their shelter was a stable. Who brought this disgrace upon them, if not the one of whom it is written that, coming into his own, his own did not receive him? John 1, 11. And, he had no sure refuge where he might lay down his head. Matthew 8, 20 Did not their poverty suffice? Why should he bring them persecution? They lived together in their home, in poverty but with sweetness, overcoming their poverty by their patience and hard work. Yet Jesus did not grant them any rest. He came into the world only to trouble them, and brought a train of sorrows in tow. Herod could not suffer the child to live. The circumstances of Christ's lowly birth could not conceal him from the tyrant's jealousy. Heaven itself betrayed the secret by pointing out Jesus Christ with a star, and by bringing adorers from afar, seemingly only to incite a pitiless persecutor. What will St. Joseph do now? Picture for yourselves a poor artisan. His hands are his only inheritance. He has no wealth beyond his workshop, no income beyond what his labours provide. He is forced to go to Egypt and to suffer a troublesome exile. And why? Because he has Jesus Christ with him. Does he complain about this difficult child who tears him away from his homeland and brings torment upon him? On the contrary, he counts himself happy to suffer in his company. All that troubles him is the peril of the divine infant, 
more dear to him than his own life? Does he hope that he will soon see the end of his disgrace? No, he does not expect it. Suffering everywhere awaits him. Simeon warned him of future sufferings for his dear son. He has already witnessed their beginning and will spend his life in continual worry about what lies ahead. As though his fidelity were unproven, here is a trial yet more troubling. Jesus himself became his persecutor. He cleverly escaped from his hands, hid himself from his oversight, and remained lost for three days. What have you done, faithful Joseph? What has become of the sacred trust that the Heavenly Father confided in you? Who can tell the tale of your suffering cries? If you have not yet understood Joseph's fatherhood, look upon his tears, look upon his sorrows, and recognize that he is a father. Mary had ample cause to say at the reunion with Jesus, Your father and I were searching for you with great sorrow. Luke 2.48 O oh, my son, she says to the Saviour, I do not fear to call him your father, and by doing so I bring no harm to the purity of your birth. It is on account of his cares and worries that I may call him your father, for he has a truly paternal anxiety. Ego et pater tus. He is joined to me by our common sorrow. See by what suffering Jesus tests fidelity and how he only wants to be with those who suffer. Soft and voluptuous souls, this child does not wish to abide with you. His poverty is ashamed of your wealth and his flesh, destined for so much torture, cannot endure your extreme softness. He seeks those strong and courageous ones who will carry his cross, who will not blush to be the companions of his poverty and misery. I leave it to you to meditate upon these holy truths. I feel myself called elsewhere, and must consider the secret of the Eternal Father that was confided to Joseph's humility. We must see Jesus Christ hidden, and Joseph hidden with him, and let the beautiful example inspire in us a love of the hidden life. 3. Where shall I find a light bright enough to shine through the darkness that surrounds the life of Joseph? What have I undertaken to wish to bring to the light of day what Scripture has covered with a mysterious silence? As it was the design of the Eternal Father that his son be hidden in the world, and that Joseph be hidden with him, let us revere the secrets of his providence without seeking to understand them, and let the hidden life of Joseph be the object of our veneration, not the subject of our discourse. All the same, it must be spoken of, and it will be useful for the salvation of souls to meditate upon such a beautiful subject. If nothing else... I will at least say that Joseph had the honour to spend every day with Jesus Christ, that together with Mary he had the greater part of his son's graces, that nevertheless Joseph was hidden, that his life, his actions and his virtues were unknown. Perhaps from so fine an example we will learn that one can be great without outward show, that one can be blessed without attracting attention, that one can have true glory without the help of fame, but by that testimony of conscience alone. Gloria nostra hec est testimonium consensiae nostre. 2 Corinthians one twelve. This thought will inspire us to set at naught the glory of the world. Yet in order that we may rightly understand the grandeur and dignity of Joseph's hidden life, let us return to the source and first admire the infinite variety of the counsels of providence in the different vocations. Among all of the vocations in the scriptures, two seem directly opposed, that of the apostles and that of Joseph. Jesus is revealed to the apostles and to Joseph, but in a contrary set of conditions. He is revealed to the apostles in order to be announced to the whole world. He is revealed to Joseph in order to be kept quiet and hidden. The apostles are lights by which the world may see Christ. 
Joseph is a veil to cover him, and under this mysterious veil is hidden Mary's virginity and the majesty of the Saviour of souls. And so we read in the Scriptures that when men wished to insult him, they said, Is this not the son of Joseph? John 6.42 In the hands of the apostles, Jesus is a word that must be preached. Preach the word of this life. Acts 5.20 In the hands of Joseph, Jesus is a hidden word that is not permitted to be revealed. Verbum absconditum. Luke 18.34 Consider what follows. The holy apostles preach the gospel so loudly that the sound of their preaching echoes even unto heaven. Joseph, on the other hand, witnessing the marvels of Jesus Christ, listens, admires, but speaks not a word. What does this difference mean? Does God contradict himself in the opposing vocations? No. All this diversity tends to teach the children of God one important truth, that Christian perfection consists in nothing but self-surrender. The one who glorified the apostles by the honour of preaching also glorified St. Joseph by the humility of silence. And from this fact we should learn that the glory of Christians lies not in brilliant achievements, but in doing what God wants of them. If we may not all have the honour of preaching Jesus Christ, we may all have the honour of obeying him. This is the glory of St. Joseph and it is the solid honour of Christianity. Do not ask, therefore, what St. Joseph did in his hidden life. It is impossible to say, and I can respond only with the words of the Holy Psalmist. The just, what has he done? Psalm 11.13 Ordinarily, the life of sinners attracts more attention than that of the just because the passions and the interests are what move the world. The sinners, says David, have bent their bows. They have loosed them against the just. They have destroyed. They have conquered. They are the only ones spoken of in the world. Psalm 10, 4 But the just, he adds, what has he done? He means that the just has done nothing, Indeed, he has done nothing in the eyes of men, because he has done everything in the eyes of God. It was in this way that Joseph the just man lived. He saw Jesus Christ and was silent. He heard him and did not speak. He contented himself with God alone, without sharing his glory with men. He accomplished his vocation for just as the apostles were the ministers of Jesus Christ revealed, so Joseph was the minister and the companion of his hidden life. We might wonder why it was necessary that Jesus hid himself, why that eternal splendor of the face of the Heavenly Father should cover itself with voluntary darkness for thirty years. Proud men, have you no idea? Men of the world, do you not know? Your ignorance stems from your pride, from your vain desire to be seen, from your infinite ambition, and from that culpable amiability that makes you shamefully devote to the effort to please men what should be employed to please God. This is why Jesus hides himself. He sees the disorder, he sees the ravages that this sin causes in our minds and he watches it corrupt our entire lives from childhood until death. He sees the virtues that it suffocates by a low and shameful fear of appearing to be wise and devout. He sees the crimes that it commits, either in order that we may accommodate ourselves to society by a damnable agreeableness, or to satisfy ambition for the sake of which one sacrifices everything else in the world. But this is not all. He sees that this desire to be seen destroys the highest virtues by making them substitute worldly glory in place of heavenly, by making us do for the love of men what ought to be done for the love of God. 
Jesus Christ sees all these evils, and he hides himself in order to teach us to set at naught the noise and show of the world. He does not think that this cross suffices to conquer the fury of this desire. He chooses, if it were possible, a lower condition, one in which he is in a certain sense even more annihilated. For in the end I shall not fear to say it. My Saviour, I recognize you better upon the cross and in the shame of your suffering than I do in this lowliness and this unknown life. Even though your body be entirely torn to shreds, your face all bloody, and, far from appearing to be God, you lack the very form of a man, all the same you are not so well hidden from me, and I see, through all of these clouds, a certain ray of your majesty in this constant resolution by which you overcome the greatest of torments. Your sorrow has its dignity, Even one of those punished alongside you adores you. But here I see only what is lowly. And in this state of annihilation, one might declare that you do injury to yourself because it seems that you do nothing. Yet Jesus does not refuse this shame, for it is his will that this injury be added to all the others he has suffered, so that in hiding himself in Nazareth, He might teach us by this great example that if he should one day show himself to the world, it will be from the desire to aid us and to obey his Father, and that all greatness consists in conforming ourselves to God's orders, however it may please him to dispose of us, and finally, that this obscurity that we so fear, but that is so illustrious and so glorious, may be chosen even by God. This is what Jesus Christ teaches us, hidden with his humble family, with Mary and Joseph, whom he joins to the obscurity of his life because they are very dear to him. Let us then take our part with them and hide ourselves with Christ. He is still hidden. He suffers every day because his name is blasphemed and his gospel mocked, because the hour of his greatest glory has not yet come. He is hidden with his Father, and, as the Holy Apostle says, we are hidden in God with him. As we are hidden with him, it is not in this place of exile that we should seek his glory. But when Jesus shows himself in his majesty, it will then be the time to appear. Come Christus apparoerit, tunc et vos apparebitis cum ipso in gloria. Colossians 3.4 O God, how sweet it will be to stand forth on that day when Jesus will praise us before his holy angels, before the whole universe, and before his heavenly Father. Let men be eternally silent about us, so that Jesus Christ may speak of us on that day. Let us nevertheless fear that terrible word that he spoke in his gospel. You have received your reward. Matthew 6, 2. You desired human glory. You have had it. You are well paid. There is nothing left for you to expect. O ingenious envy of our enemy, who gives us the eyes of men so as to take away those of God, who, by a malicious gratitude, offers to reward our virtues, believing that God will not then reward them. Wretch, I want none of your glory. Neither your brilliance nor your vain display can pay me for my work. I await a crown from a hand that is dearer to me, and a reward from a more powerful arm. When Jesus appears in his majesty, then, only then will I stand forth. It is there, faithful ones, that you will see what I am not able to describe for you today. You will discover the marvels of the hidden life of Joseph you will know what he did during those long years, and how glorious it is to hide oneself with Jesus Christ. He is, doubtless, not one of those who received his reward in this world. God will repair the obscurity of his life, and his glory will be all the greater for having been reserved for the world to come. 
Let us then love the hidden life in which Jesus cloaked himself with Joseph. What does it matter that men see us? The man to whom the eyes of God do not suffice is foolishly ambitious. We do injury to God when we perform for others. If you have had great tasks and important works laid upon you, if it is necessary that your life be a public one, at least meditate seriously on this truth, that, in the end, your death will be private, and your honours will not follow you. May the noise that men make all around you not prevent you from listening to the words of the Son of God. He does not say, Happy are the praised, but he says in his Gospel, Happy are they who are insulted for the love of me. Matthew 5.11 Tremble then in whatever earthly glory you attain, lest you be judged worthy of the condemnations of the Gospel. Yet if the world refuses to reproach us, let us reproach ourselves before God for our ingratitude and ridiculous vanity. Let us reflect on all of the shame of our life. Let us at least be darkened in our own eyes by a humble confession of our sins. And let us participate as we are able in the shame of Jesus, so that we may participate in his glory. Amen.